Take her to our holiday house. Mates rates. <laughs> How did you get that? Equity, mate. Equity. It's something that many lenders seem to push and promote when interest rates are low. And with so many economic experts expecting interest rates to start falling sooner rather than later, today I'm going to explain what equity actually is. It's probably not what you're hearing from so many others. Number two, how to use equity as a foundation to start investing in property. And number three, some of the risks you need to be aware of when you're using equity. Hello, it's Nero here, and let's begin by looking at an example. Let's imagine you bought a house a few years ago for say a million dollars. You have a debt on that house of 80% of the purchase price, so your debt is $800,000. Now, let's imagine that some years have now gone by and your home has risen in value and you've paid down the debt. So maybe your debt has gone from $800,000 to $700,000. So the question then is, well, how do you work out how much equity you have on this particular property? Well, the first thing is you need to know what the property is worth. Now, if you look around and see maybe similar properties selling for 1.6 million or 1.7 million, that's a great ballpark figure, but you can't use that figure in this situation. Instead, you need to go and get a bank valuation and expect that the bank valuation will come in a little bit lower than what you think you can sell the property for in the open market. Banks are always going to be conservative. They're ultimately just trying to protect themselves. So let's say that you think the property can sell for 1.6 million, but the bank values it at $1.5 million. Okay, so then how do you work out equity? Now, most people will say, oh, well, my home's worth 1.5 million. I have a debt of $700,000. I have equity of $800,000. That's the biggest misconception when it comes to equity. Actually, it's one of two. I'll explain the second one in just a moment. Equity doesn't actually work that way because remember, equity means debt secured against a property. Okay, so that means that in most cases, a bank will only lend you up to 80% of the valuation of the property. So how will that work? Well, the bank value the property at $1.5 million. They then say, okay, 80% is $1.2 million. You have a debt of $700,000 existing. So therefore, your available equity is $1.2 million minus 700,000, which is $500,000, okay? Here's a second misconception though. Just because this is how the numbers might even work in your scenario is no guarantee that the bank will give you this equity. I see so many people who say, I've got lots of equity, so I'm sure the bank will lend me. I mean, I've got equity, isn't that all you need to buy property? Again, that's a second misconception here. You need equity, but then you need borrowing capacity to be able to release this equity. Because as I said earlier on, equity is debt secured against the property. And when the bank is giving you equity, what they're trying to work out is, well, do you have the capability of paying this money back? That's their only concern here. So if, for example, you've already retired, or maybe you're in between jobs, or maybe you've started a new business and you don't have two years worth of tax returns, whatever the case might be, at that singular point in time, you won't actually be able to get any equity if you don't have the borrowing capacity to service this. On the flip side, you might only find that, okay, yes, you might have technically $500,000 in available equity, but based on the bank's assessment of you, and it's always their assessment of you, they may only give you $200,000. So always remember that your borrowing capacity matters as much as equity. And I've seen too many people who've bought property, maybe it's an investment property that's severely negatively geared, and then they go to try and get out equity and the bank says, sorry, based on their assessment, they won't lend you any more money. Or people have got a home with a big mortgage, and sure, the home has gone up in value, but because they still have a massive mortgage based on their incomes, the bank says, sorry, no more money coming. And that means that the equity is essentially untouchable for you. You can't actually use it to build wealth. So make sure you're getting your borrowing capacity checked as well as your equity. Moving forwards in this episode, I'm gonna assume that the borrowing capacity matches what I'm saying here. 
Now, so you have your $500,000 equity. What do you do with that? Well, you'll normally say get that equity released into a separate account. So from an internet banking perspective, what you should see is you should see one account for say the debt of $500,000 and then one account which will be an offset account for $500,000 and the two will literally cancel each other out, which means on day one, because you haven't used any of the $500,000 in equity, you're not paying any interest on that just yet. Also, when you're doing this, make sure you have an account set up for the $500,000 that is separate from your existing $700,000 mortgage that I'm showing you in this example. Because when it comes time to do your taxes, you want to have complete clarity. You want to be able to show the ATO, okay, this $700,000, that's your personal mortgage, and then this $500,000 second bucket, I guess, you're using that purely for investments. When it comes to doing your taxes, clarity is king. So don't put this all together in one bundle. Make sure you separate them. Now with the $500,000, when do you then start paying interest on that amount? It begins only when you start using the funds in that account. So let's say, for example, you maybe take out $10,000 to put as a holding deposit on a particular investment property. Well then, you only pay interest on that $10,000. So you only pay interest on the amount that you use. But it's very important to consider this when you start looking at investment properties. So now let's imagine you decide you want to go out and buy an investment property for say $700,000. You take out a loan against that property of 80%, which is $560,000. Great. So now where does though the remaining 20% deposit come from, which is $140,000? plus your other fees and charges like stamp duty, maybe if you use a buyer's agent, uh, legal fees, etc. Okay, so let's say for example, that might come to an extra $40,000 just for this example. So you need to come up with now the $140,000, which is a 20% deposit, plus your purchase costs of $40,000. In total, you need to come up with an extra $180,000. Where does that money come from? That money then comes from your equity. Now this brings us to a very important point. You can see here that $180,000 from your equity plus $560,000 actually equals $740,000. But the purchase price is only $700,000. So yes, when you're doing things this way, you're actually borrowing 100% of the purchase price plus all the purchase costs. You're not using any of your own savings. Now there's two ways in you can do this. Number one is you can put everything with one bank. And most lenders are very happy with this. Personally, I don't like it. Personally, I like to keep the debt against my investment property. So in this case, the $560,000 that's secured against the investment property, I want to keep that with one lender. And then all the debt associated with my house, whether it's my personal mortgage, or whether I'm using it for investing, that's with a separate lender. I like to keep things separate because when you put things together with one lender, even if they might entice you with a slightly better interest rate, you are at risk of something called cross collateralization. Now, most people who work for a bank will tell you that's a good thing because that's what they're trained to say. My concern though is that when you cross collateralize, you end up putting everything that you have with one lender which means that they have control of your portfolio. Now, maybe if it's your first property, it may not matter. But if you are planning on building a significant portfolio with multiple properties, say like I have or like many of our clients have, you want to start looking at different lenders to keep things separate. Either way, you're borrowing everything you need to buy the property and not using any extra savings that you might have. However, this then brings us to another point is the cash flow on the property. I see too many people when they're presenting properties to people, they'll say, oh, look, based on this purchase price of $760,000 and then based on the borrowing against the property of 80%, which is in this case $560,000, your property will be XYZ cash flow. What are they forgetting? They're forgetting the fact that in this example, you're borrowing not 80%, you're borrowing 105%. So therefore, 
you need to ensure that you're taking the full borrowings into consideration. You're taking into account the 560 that's secured against the investment property, plus the 180 that you took out of your equity. So in other words, you should be doing your cash flow numbers in, on this scenario based on the fact that you're borrowing $740,000. So now that you've got one property and you've only used $180,000 of your equity, that still leaves you with plenty. So what could you do now? Well, you can go out there and buy a second investment property. And let's say again, same scenario, $700,000 purchase price, 80% debt secured against the investment property, which is $560,000. And then you take out an extra $180,000 worth of equity. So now imagine that you've taken out $360,000 worth of equity. So you've got two investment properties and you decide that you don't wanna take out any more that's secured against your own home, but you still wanna keep investing. What can you do? Well, this is where asset selection really matters. You can't just buy any properties. You want to ensure that you buy properties that are stepping stones to future properties, which means they need to satisfy two criteria. Number one, they need to have strong potential for capital growth, so they rise in value, but they also need to have strong potential for rental growth, so that the cash flow improves. So that sure, you might be starting off negative right now in 2024 because interest rates are the highest they've been at for over a decade. But over time, you wanna see rents rise, which means your cash flow will improve, which will then improve your borrowing capacity over time. And so as these properties then rise in value, what could you do? Well, you can then go out and buy additional properties over time. And maybe you end up with a portfolio in total of five investment properties. Now, all of these have debt secured against them and you still have debt against your home. And so the question then is, well, what do you do next? How do you finish this off? How do you actually get to a stage where you can actually have some sort of financial freedom and financial security? I know that what I'm about to say next will contradict what so many other people on the internet will tell you because most people will say that you should buy property and never, ever, ever sell. In my opinion, that's just dumb. That might have worked 20 years ago when properties were priced at $300,000. Today, not so much. Instead, what you need to be open to is the fact that you might need to sell one or two of these properties. That will immediately pay off the debt that's remaining on those two properties, but you can then use the profits to either pay down your personal mortgage, maybe pay off some debt on your investment properties, whatever the case happens to be. It's all gonna come down to your goals and what phase of your wealth building strategy you're in. If you're in the phase where you are still actively working, you've got borrowing capacity and you wanna keep building a portfolio, you're acquiring properties, then you just keep buying whenever you can. But if you're now getting to the stage where you want to sell down some debt, you wanna maybe take it easy from a work perspective, well, that's when you look to consolidate debt, that's when you look to pay down these properties. Equity at some point, especially when it's taken out against your home, does need to be paid back. And you just need to work out the best way of doing so. But either way, when you use equity from your own home, you can start building a portfolio of properties that over time will pay you a passive income. And if you wanna know more about how to do that, then check out the link in the description below to get totally for free the digital version and the audio version of my book. I really hope this explanation of how equity works and what you need to consider will help you in your property investing journey. Good luck.